Well, I want you to open your hearts and watch a video of a testimony of two kids some of you know. It's right here. My name is Daniela. And my name is Shalom. <laughs> We're just kidding. <laughs> no, my name is Shalom and I've been serving on the worship team for 14 years. And I've been playing drums and just been in all aspects of worship. And in doing so, I was able to meet my wife. Me! So Shalom met me in a production called Jesus of Nazareth in 2015, where I gave my testimony. And we really took off from there. We got married. And we had our beautiful daughter named Emma Jane. But our lives changed forever when I heard the word Shalom, you have cancer. We had little time to adjust. I mean, it was something that happened so quickly. So we immediately told our family, our pastors, our friends, and the outpouring of love that we received was amazing. Thankfully, Pastor Rich, along with his friend, Dr. Dave Martin, came to visit us at the hospital that first week I was diagnosed. And they came and prayed the prayer of faith of healing over us. And they reminded us that we will be okay in this journey. That prayer really set the tone for our journey to come. We had to really look at each other and we said, okay, God, let's suit up and let's fight. And we really had to take the initiative to remind ourselves that we were going to overcome this. In the midst of everything, it was very difficult. I had moments where I couldn't get up, moments where I couldn't sleep, moments where I couldn't eat. But I had to continually remind myself that I was going to press forward and that the prayer of healing that Pastor Rich had gave was going to be the one foundation I stood on. I constantly told myself that I'm choosing to do things God's way and however he wanted to go about the situation, I was willing and ready. And the enemy was really trying to distract us. Uh, just financially, we were having problems. We were away from our daughter at months at a time. Uh, we got the news that Shalom uh, would be sterile and we wouldn't be able to have any more children. So all these things, uh, the enemy was really trying to distract us from our main focus, which was Shalom's healing. As a wife, my priority was to really pray for him. The enemy can take whatever he wants, but Shalom was not for the taking. Different things like chemotherapy, radiation therapy, even the bone marrow transplant took a heavy toll on my body. I was diagnosed also with a lung infection just because of the weird side effects that comes in doing these different treatments to your body. They couldn't figure out what, what was causing this. They just said, let's see if it clears on its own. We'll, do, we'll run more testing and then you can come back to us in a couple of weeks. So a couple of weeks pass and the doctor calls us back into his office and he tells me somehow the infection cleared up on its own. But that's not even the great news. The real good news is that the doctor informed me that I am in complete full remission and further testing, further scans continue to progress, but the result was still the same and that I no longer have any active cancer cells in my body. We just wanna encourage everyone not to give up. Your healing is there, whatever it may look like. Miracles are real and don't give up when times are tough. When God is with you and within you, everything and anything is possible. And we want to send our thank yous to everybody at Trinity. Yes. Pastor Rich and Robin, the whole entire Trinity staff, and the entire Trinity Church congregation. Without you guys, none of this would be possible. Yes, without your prayers, your love, and support, we wouldn't be here today telling you this story. So thank you so much, and we love you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Wow. Huh? How many believe Jesus is alive today? Hallelujah. On your chair, there is a page of notes that you can follow along with today. I trust that you will. I'd like you to open once again to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses today 7 through 11. This has been our theme passage these past three weeks. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another 
gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Today I want to talk to you on this last message, the power gifts, and they are faith gift, the healing gift, and the miracle gift. Faith gift, healing gift, and the miracle gift. This is our final session in a three-week series called Holy, 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 which has been a series on spiritual gifts. There are nine of them. We've covered six today. We will cover the last three. Several weeks ago, I started with the revelation gifts. You remember, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, distinguishing of spirits. And beginning after that day and through these last couple weeks, I have gotten so many texts and emails and calls responding to this sermon series. I, I didn't know something would touch uh, our people's heart like this series has. Last week, I talked on the vocal gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, which are interpretation or tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Today, we're going to look at the power of gifts. And the first power gift is faith. Uh, when you look at this gift of faith, it's something more than just faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 6, by the way, this chapter is called the hall of faith in Scripture. And Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 6 says these words. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about we, what we do not see. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hallelujah. Um, when we were born, all of us, according to Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, were given a measure of faith. At birth, every human on the planet received a measure of faith. Now, let, let, let's look at this, this one part of our body called muscles. When you were born as a baby, you had muscles when you were born. But they were mushy muscles. Does that make sense? There was no strength to those muscles. They had been, you know, being developed for nine months in your mother's womb. But when you came out, there was nothing there. You'd squeeze, all my boys, I'd squeeze mushy. It's a little nothing, just nothing. And what happened is those children had to begin to develop those muscles by pushing against something, all right? And as they would push against stuff, uh, they would begin to tighten up their muscles. My little Wyatt, I see him uh, on his stomach. I see him push up and look around. He'll hold himself up with his hands. He'll look around like that. You know, when I uh, work out, uh, Monday through Friday with TJ. My last exercise is a stretching exercise. And the very last of the stretching exercises, I lay on my stomach, and then I have to push up. And then I go into the tuck position, trying to stretch out. But I was thinking the other day, I'm pushing up. I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's what my grandson's doing right now. Am I a baby again? Well, they, they have kind of turned to mush. You've got to watch. In other words, your, 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 your muscles develop as you exercise your muscles. As you exercise them, they get stronger. That's the way faith is. If we didn't have faith, none of us would have learned 
to ride a bike. Wait a minute, let's back up. None of us would have learned to walk. Forget bike riding. None of us would have learned to walk without faith. You see, somewhere in your life, you started to decide, I don't want to crawl anymore. You don't even remember it, unless you didn't walk till you were six or seven. But you don't remember it, but you started thinking to yourself, I don't want to crawl anymore. And so you started pushing up, and then you'd get by a table, and you'd pull up, exercise, and finally you'd be on your, and then you'd practice it. My little uh, daughter, Nora Wilkerson in New York City, is 14 months old. She started walking two months ago. She is now walking all over New York City. She's my New York walker. But I watched her on video. She fell a million times, and she cried a million times. And you know, she'd be screaming, crying, and she'd go over to the table and pull herself up again and try it again. See, faith made that little girl walk, and she got stronger and stronger, and now she doesn't fall. Uh, unless she runs into something in the dark. I mean, she doesn't fall. She's only 14 months old, and she's walking like crazy. Now back to bike riding. Because no one looks at Nora and says, hey, you know what? She's got a gift for walking. Would you look at that? That's a gift. No one says that. No one says that about you. Look, look at it. There goes Betty. Oh, walking. Wow. No one, no one remarks that you're walking. That, that's, not any, that's not a gift, all right? But let's go back to bike riding. I mentioned that briefly. Let's talk about the Tour de France. The Tour de France. The greatest bikers in the world in about a month or less will start off on those racing bikes in Germany. And for the next 21 days and 2,200 miles, they will leave Germany and move into France and into the Pyrenees and the French Alps, those mountains, down and up and down. I mean, friends, some people say that this is the most grueling, torturous, physical exercise on planet Earth for an extended three-week period of time. And they will wind up after 21 days coming into Paris and past the Arc de Triomphe and someone wins that race. And when those riders come buzzing back into France after 21 days through the mountains, you know what people are thinking as they fly by? Man, they've got a gift. That's a gift. Oh, my goodness. Now, some of you in this room, you still can't ride a bike. Most of us can ride a bike. But none of us in this room do anybody say to us, you got a gift to ride a bike. Nobody, nobody does. But when those people come in through the Pyrenees and the French Alps in France in about a month, they'll be saying, man, that guy's got a gift to ride. That's a gift. Friends, that is absolutely the way faith operates. The more you exercise your faith, Every time you come to the end of an opportunity and you reach forward to another opportunity to stretch your faith a little bit more, your faith gets going and it keeps going and it keeps going. And in time, people says, that's a gift. That is a gift. Let me say this. When you walked in today, you all exercised faith. You sat down in that chair. You had confidence that that chair would hold you. And thank God it did. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever in your life seen a person sit down on a chair and the chair not hold them? Raise your hand if you've ever seen that. All right? So the point is, it is possible to strip the molecular structure of the chair you're sitting on. It's possible to split those molecules and crash to the ground or break the molecules down in the legs of that chair and crash to the ground. But no one came into this room this morning. Not one of you came in and, and walked up to the, oh, oh, God. Oh, help me, help me, help me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to sit down. I'm sitting down. God, watch, watch. Oh, God, I'm going to, ah, ah. No one did that. I saw people coming in arrogantly sit down on the chair as hard as they could. 
I'm going to tell you something. That is a form of faith. As you exercise your faith, your faith expands. The gift of faith is like that. Friends, don't ever forget it. You see, people like Noah started, started believing God, believing God, to the point that he was the only man with his family on the planet Earth that believed in God. And God said, because you have, I'm going to spare humankind because of you. And then he starts to build an ark for years. And he's ridiculed and made fun of. But through faith, he pushes through. And one day the rains begin, and it lifts he and his family above the storm. And after 40 days and night, his family is spared because of faith in God. I think of Moses, who was on the backside of a desert for 40 years, watching his, father's, his, his father-in-law's sheep. He was just a shepherd at the age of 80 when God said, I know now that you're ready. And he led him into leading the children of Israel out of slavery and out of bondage. And he led him to the Red Sea and saw him step into those waters. And he saw his faith make those waters split in two so that his entire nation, three million people, could walk across on dry ground. I'm thinking of a young boy who watched his father's sheep in his dad's backyard. His name was David, the last of eight sons. And day in and day out, he went to take care of his dad's sheep. And one day he tore a lion apart with his bare hands. Another day a bear apart that had come to eat his father's sheep. He tore them apart. Who knows whatever else exploits he did in those sheep fields during those years of guarding his dad's sheep. But as he was doing it, his faith muscles were building and growing. And eventually, there was a giant that threatened his nation. And he said, hey, God help me to rip a lion apart with my bare hands and a bear apart with my bare hands. What is this uncircumcised giant in the face of Almighty God? You're going down, pal. And David took him out by the power of Almighty God. Now, friends, that is called a gift. Your faith can begin to grow today, and your faith can begin to move beyond sitting on a chair to the point that one day your faith becomes this gargantuous gift from God. And when you speak, things happen. When you act, things happen. And people begin to say, he's got faith. She's got a gift of faith. Wow! They do more than just sit on chairs. They can ride a bike through the Pyrenees. That's real faith. There's another gift in this passage of power gifts, and it's the gift of healing. The gift of healing. You see, both the gift of faith and the gift of healing work the same way. And it comes from a principle that Jesus mentions in Matthew 25 and verse 21. You remember the faithful stewards that were given something by their master and they invested it while he was gone and it multiplied. One did not invest and he lost everything. But here's what the master said to the faithful stewards when he got back who had done the right thing. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. That's the way faith works. You start small, you build up, you keep building up, you keep building. You're faithful over the op- the challenge God gets. You're faithful with that challenge. You get another challenge, it's bigger. You're faithful with that. It keeps building, building, building. That's the same with healing. Healing, a gift of healing, starts When you get a cold and you pray the cold out of your body in less than the normal two weeks. The gift of healing starts small. But there are those people who say, I'm not going to bow to this sickness. I'm going to trust God for my physical healing. At the end of the service today, we are going to anoint those with oil that need to be anointed for divine healing in your body. Don't worry. We will bless people out after the altar call so that if you must run, you can run. 
but we're going to have a time of healing at these altars because we believe in the gift of healing. Um, the gift of healing starts small and you just be, become faithful with it. And pretty soon you believe God that your neighbor's going to get healed. And you begin to pray for your neighbor. In fact, you go over to your neighbor's house and you anoint her or him with oil and say, I'm just going to keep believing. I believe God has given us a gift of healing. I believe it's going to happen. Now, I want to show you a passage in the scripture. You remember when this paralyzed man was brought by four friends to Jesus, and they couldn't get into the house because the house was packed. It wasn't a thousand people there, but the house was packed, so they couldn't get the man to Jesus. These four men weren't stopped. They crawled up the side of the house with the man on his mat. They connected four ropes to the corners of this mat. They peeled back the roof, and they lowered the man through the hole in the roof till he came and rested in front of Jesus where Jesus was teaching. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at him in Mark chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. And Jesus said, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now, who do you and I know for sure by name? that was in that room other than Jesus and the paralyzed man that witnessed this miracle. Who do you and I know for sure were there? Well, we know that Matthew was there because Matthew writes about it, right? We know that Luke was there because Luke writes the same story. Luke was there. We know that John was there because John the Beloved, he writes the same story in his gospel. We know that Mark was not there, although I just read from the book of Mark. You see, Mark was just a little boy at this time, maybe 13, 14 years of age. And the truth is that Mark was not the author of his name book. Peter was the author of the book of Mark. Mark was the scribe. He was the writer. History tells us that Years after Jesus ascended into heaven, the Bible tells us that in Acts chapter 9, I believe it is, Paul, eight, maybe it was, eight or nine, Saul was walking towards, uh, on the Damascus Trail, and he's on his way to take Christians and put them in jail. He's a radical Jewish liar. And on the way, God knocks him off his feet, saves him. And the Bible tells us that Barnabas takes Paul on their first missionary journey after Saul's conversion. And on that missionary journey is a young man named Mark, John Mark. It's Barnabas' nephew. And most theologians believe he's about 16 years of age when he goes with them. Halfway through the trip, John Mark gets discouraged, homesick for mama. So they send him back to his mother. They finish their missionary journey, and Paul and Barnabas get ready for the second missionary journey. And Barnabas says, we're going to take John Mark again. Paul says, oh, no. No, we're not going to waste our time there. We need some help on the road. This guy bails, and we're left standing, you and me, to work miracles and clean up the mess. We're not doing that. And they got into such a fight. The Bible says that Paul took Silas on the second missionary journey, and Barnabas took his nephew, John Mark. And John, Mark, and Paul, and, and Barnabas went to Cyprus, they tell us. And Barnabas discipled his nephew. And in time, history tells us, he handed his nephew, John Mark, off to Peter. And John Mark became Peter's companion, like Silas was Paul's companion. He was an understudy, but he was also his helper on the road. And in time... When Paul's dying, he says, hey, bring John Mark with you. He's helpful to me in the ministry. Well, thank God we know that Peter and John for sure were in that, on that roof or in that building when those men lowered that paralyzed man into that room. After this, before Jesus goes to heaven, 
He says in John 14, 12, I shared with a couple weeks ago, Verily, truly, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Now, how did they do greater things than Jesus did? Well, first of all, they had to do things at least as much as Jesus did. And Peter is a chicken at the cross, denies Jesus three times, fulfills Jesus' prophecy that Jesus prophesied that would happen. But after the cross, he's forgiven, he's changed, and then Jesus tells he and the other disciples, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost, and you're going to have so much power you won't believe it. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter is there with 120 other people. He is one of the ones that gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that Peter stands up on that day, no fear in him, and starts preaching the gospel. And when he gets done preaching, no fear. He's got a gift of faith. 3,000 Jewish people accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And the church of Jesus Christ is born. A couple days later, he, Peter, and John head up to the temple to pray in the afternoon, the Bible says. They have to go through the gate beautiful. There's a crippled man at the gate beautiful. He's been crippled since birth every day. His family and friends pick him up, and they haul him to the gate beautiful. Lay him there. says, your job today, once again, Marty, is to beg all day long. If you can get two nickels and a dime, that'll be more than you did laying at home in bed. That's what he did his whole life. Now as an adult man, he's laying there, and we're about to see this first healing miracle. Peter and John come walking up. Remember, they were there years before when Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do. Maybe less than a year. I, I just said that. It wasn't too long. Greater things. And the man says, here's what, the man says, hey, can you give me some money? Here's what the Bible says, Acts 3, uh, verses 6 through 8. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He had no muscles. So instantly God gives him muscles in the feet and ankles, and he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Right there, Peter and John demonstrate the gift of healing which was given to them on that day. So it, it, it moved from there is no Jesus, I don't believe in Jesus, blankety, blankety, blank Jesus, to within a few short days being baptized in the Holy Ghost, having enough faith to stand up and preach in front of thousands of people, 3,000 get saved, and then he's walking to the temple, and all of a sudden there's a sick guy, he's thinking of the guy that gets lowered through the roof, he's thinking of Jesus saying, greater things than these shall you do, so he goes, I might as well give it a shot, and in that moment, he's given the gift of healing. I remember when I was 27, a guy that was four months younger than me came through Sacramento, California. His name was Benny Hinn. Both of us 27 at that time. He had been announced as the next great healer in the world. Our church was across the street from the statewide cerebral palsy headquarters for people with cerebral palsy. All day long, those people with cerebral palsy were wheeled across this main highway, were dragged across this main hallway, so that when the service started that night, the first four rows, and it was quite a bit wider than our church here, the first four rows were filled with wheelchair patients. Some were laying on beds, uh, no way to even sit in a wheelchair. And poor Benny Hinn got up that night, to pray for the sick. And folks, it was bad. I mean, it was bad. Benny preached for 90 minutes trying to figure out what he was going to do with these four rows of upfront sick people. And finally, he got enough courage to run down the aisle 
and reach across to some guy in the back and say, you've got a heart problem. And the guy goes, no, I, I, don't, I, I don't have it. He goes, yeah, yeah, you do now. Get in the aisle in the name of Jesus. You know, hits him on the head. He goes down. And there were about five or six more events like that. It was terrible. It was a crash and burn. I was there, saw it with my own eyes. And I thought, that's terrible. But you know what? Benny Hinn believed he had a gift of healing. No one in the room believed it after that. I didn't believe it. But Benny Hinn believed God had given him a gift of healing. And the next time I saw him years later, auditoriums were jammed. I saw him on TV, auditoriums jammed. The most crazy healing miracles you've ever witnessed in your life were performed not by this man, by the power of the Holy Ghost through him, this gift of healing. Let me tell you something, folks. I don't care what somebody else thinks about you. If you believe God is going to give you a gift, you hunger and thirst for that gift. You study about that gift. You stay up all night long and pray for that gift. And in time, God's going to give you that gift. I believe that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Those of you that hunger and thirst after healing so that it becomes a 24-7, thing and you're not even sick in your body God's going to give you a gift of healing if you trust God for it if you believe it today shout something come on hallelujah the third power gift is what we know as miracles the difference between miracles and healing is that healing can take place through the intervention of man you can be healed if you've got a, a sickness with a pill. You get the right antibiotic, within a couple days you're healed. Man was given the ingenuity to develop that pill. That's all part of God's divine healing plan. Uh, the more desperate people are around the world with lack of medicine, the greater physical miracles that take place that you hear that just happened at the hand of God because there's no other way for it to accomplish. But... The miracle gift is a gift that man cannot make happen. When that Red Sea split, there's not a man on the planet that could make that happen. Not possible. I, I go on and on and on. That kind of a gift is a gift of miracles. And it is totally divine. I have told you so many times about my son, Graham. And the thing that I want to say about Graham is that he was dead for 12 minutes. It's documented at the age of six months. And God brought him back alive from the dead. We have the documented work by medical technicians, doctors, nurses. But, you know, after it happened, and he was safe in our arms, over a two-year period of time, my wife began to doubt that he had been sick at all. She'd heard me tell the story over and over. And she began to doubt that it even happened at all. And, of course, there's not a mother in the world that wants to confess my son died and came back to life. I mean, they don't want to talk about death. She wanted to just say he was sick. One day, my wife and I were at that same children's hospital two years later, 1989. This had happened in 1987. And we were with a family that had a very sick child at this particular children's hospital. And Robin and I went in and prayed for the child. I was off the road that week. And as we were leaving that child's bedroom, we ran into the doctor that was the head doctor, and continued to be the head doctor at that children's hospital. And that doctor was there that afternoon that Robin brought Graham into that hospital. She was there when they did the cut downs on his ankles and, and put the tubes in his ankles to try to jump start his heart and get him going again. And I said, you know, Doc, Robin over the last couple of years has become a little bit doubtful that it happened at all. She's, and she goes, look, Rich, that's totally normal. She goes, moms try to get that out of their mind completely. I said, well, 
I've told, she goes, tell me what your story is. I told her my story in detail. It's about 15 minutes. And she said, every last word you've said is true. And Robin's gone, okay, whatever. And she goes, look, look, maybe I could do something to help you. Come with me. And Robin and I followed the doctor down the hallway and through a series of other hallways and into this giant room that was a room of black file cabinets. Do you remember when we used to use file cabinets? Now it's all on hard drive. But back then, oh, my goodness, there were just reams and reams and reams and, you know, uh, file cabinet after file cabinet. And she went way down to the end, down to the bottom corner where the W, X, Y, and Z names were. And she opened this big, wide file cabinet and pulled out, after she looked for a while, this big, wide, legal, you know, manila folder with Graham's paperwork in it. And she said, maybe this will help. And she brought it over. She said, you can look at all the paperwork, but just look at the cover. She didn't know we were coming that day. This had been written in 1987. Can I show you the cover of that file cabinet? That's what the doctor had written on his file two years earlier. Graham Wilkerson, Miracle 87. She said, you got to realize, Wilkerson's, no doctors could heal him. No doctors could make him alive again. It was a miracle. And in your case, you believe the miracle came from the hand of your God. I'll go with that because it was a miracle. Today, my friends, your God is in this room. His name is Jesus Christ. He is walking up and down these aisles and these cross aisles with his nail-scarred hands just waiting to touch somebody. And today, I want you to get ready for what God wants to do.